Are you a master of deceit? <laughs> Sounds kind of like the name of some um, comic book supervillain, doesn't it? Sorry. Just having a little Star Wars moment there. But you know the kind of person I'm talking about when I talk about a master of deceit. Someone who actually treats deception like it's some kind of an art form. You know, actually taking pride in their own devious nature. So just what does uh, the Bible have to say about someone like this? Well, if we look at Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. Now, this is Jehovah God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, and this is regarding the people of Judah. When we read this, we read, Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he layeth his weight. I always get this mental image when I read their tongue is as an arrow shot out. I'm always picturing this, uh, this frog, you know, the way uh, they go after a fly with their tongue, just, just like lightning fast. It's like, you know, like that. So that's verse 8 regarding the people of Judah. So we get, we get a pretty clear picture of the kind of people that we're dealing with here. And then in verse 9 we read, Shall I not visit them? For these things, saith the Lord, shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? So, God has seen the deceptive and dishonest nature of the people of Judah. And as we see here in verse 9, this is not something that he takes lightly. Now, unfortunately, the times we're living in today have um, afforded us more opportunities than ever before in history to deceive our fellow man. You know, things such as identity theft, internet fraud, phone solicitation scams. Uh, these types of things have become so commonplace in our society today that most of us don't even blink an eye anymore. You know, when we hear about the new scam that's out there. But, anyway, as we're sitting here and we are, we're shaking our finger at those evil, evil reprobates. Feeling pretty good about ourselves for never having cheated some nice elderly woman out of her life savings. We might be tempted to look in a mirror and say, well, <laughs> hey... I know I'm a sinner, but I've never really thought of myself as a deceptive person. Well, first of all, as Christians, we shouldn't be so concerned as what we think of ourselves anyway, right? We should be more concerned about what our Father in Heaven thinks of us. But if God were to judge our behavior based on how many man-made laws that we've broken. You know, sort of grading us on a curve, so to speak, as he compares our actions to those of this group of ruthless, hardened criminals over here. Well, then, most of us would probably be in pretty good shape, right? But is that really how it works? If we look at James chapter 2, verse 10, <clears throat> we read, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. This is why we needed a Savior. Okay, God's ways are perfect, and part of his perfect plan was to send the Lord Jesus Christ 
to die for our sins, yours and mine. But even as Christians, a lot of the time we fail to recognize our own sins. So the question we really should be asking here is when God looks at us, does he see the same deceptive nature that he saw in the people of Judah? Well, first of all, what does it actually mean to be deceitful? Now, if we look up the, the term deceit in the dictionary, would we read something like the act of stealing someone's identity and cheating someone out of their hard-earned money and possessions? Would we see a... Uh, would we see a picture of this guy? You know, one of the greatest deceivers of the 1980s? Hopefully some of you got that. But no, no, if we look up the term deceit, uh, one of the definitions that we would see, and most of them are pretty similar, is the action or practice of deceiving someone by concealing or misrepresenting the truth. Now, some of the synonyms listed for the word deceit are lying, trickery, deviousness, and pretense. So now that we have a you know a little bit clearer picture of what it actually means to deceive someone, and we see that deceit and dishonesty, you know, pretty much go hand in hand with each other. Well, let's take a look at some um, examples of deceit that are pretty commonplace in today's society. Now, the first one I'm going to mention, and I know I'm going to be stepping on some toes with this one. But the first one I want to talk about is the filing of our yearly taxes. Now, it's... a uh, Okay, we're in tax time now, you know, some of you uh, have probably already completed your taxes, some of you may like to wait till the last minute, but without me even saying another word, most of you probably know where I'm going with this. Now there is a website called statisticbrain.com. And it's exactly what it sounds like, it deals in popular statistics, uh, so those of you who, you know, might find statistics fascinating and entertaining, you might want to look at this site, statisticbrain.com. But anyway, this website claims that the estimated number of people who cheat or lie on their yearly taxes is 1,625,000. Now, while that's a pretty significant number... I wouldn't be surprised personally if the number wasn't actually much higher than that. But I'm also willing to bet that a lot of those people, a lot of these people who cheat on their taxes, claim to be Christians. A lot of them probably go to church every Sunday, you know, read their Bible on a regular basis, and yet they somehow seem to justify all that unreported income fraudulent deductions that they put on their tax forms year after year. Insurance fraud is another very common method of deceit that a lot of seemingly good people commit these days. Well, why do they do that? Well, you know, because we're going to make those rotten insurance companies pay double or even triple the amount it actually cost just to get them back for all those years of payment after payment that I gave them when nothing went wrong. It's still deceitful, folks. Yeah. And just to name another example, what about that car? What about that car that you sold to that buyer on Craigslist last year? Were you really 
completely upfront and honest about the, your vehicle's condition? Or did you just did you somehow forget to mention that thousand dollar repair bill that the buyer would be faced with once he once he discovered that the transmission was faulty? <laughs> but hey, check out those subwoofers, right? I mean, hey, who needs a good transmission when you got a great sound system? Hmm. If we look at the uh, story of Ananias and his wife Sapphira in uh, chapter 5 of the book of Acts, I think this is a prime example of two seemingly good people who attempt to deceive the apostles in a similar fashion. Now, Ananias and his wife Sapphira, they, they were a married couple. They were members of the early church, the church when it was, when it was in its infancy. And um, they owned a piece of land, which they sold. Now, to their credit, all right, before we start bashing Ananias and Sapphira, they did give a portion of the amount they received for the land to the apostles. Yes, they did. They didn't give the entire amount, but they did give some. All right, they um, they sold the land. They gave a portion to the apostles, and they kept the remainder for themselves. Doesn't sound so bad, right? Well, if we take a closer look at the story we see that it really wasn't so much what they gave, but the deceitful, there's that word again, and dishonest nature in which they gave it. Now, Ananias and Sapphira, they were, as I said before, they were members of the early church, and the church at that time would seem very odd to us in today's day and age and that while there were people there were members of the early church that did own they did possess lands properties they had material possessions of their own the way that they viewed these things they viewed these things in such an unselfish manner that's what i mean when i say it would be odd to us in today's day and age they viewed these things these properties the these lands they viewed them as gifts from God, which is what they are, which is what they still are today. But because they felt so strongly about this, a lot of the time they would sell these possessions, they would sell these properties, and they would give the entire amount of money to the church, the whole amount without even hesitating, because they didn't view these, these properties and things as for their own benefit. They view these things as given to them for the benefit and use of the entire church body. So, while we may not see the same kind of selfless generosity when we look at the actions of Ananias and his wife Sapphira, the fact of the matter is, as I said before, Peter, the Apostle Peter did not condemn them for the amount of that they gave, but the deceitful way in which they gave it. Now, Ananias and his wife Sapphira, they were, these people were all about keeping up appearances. All right, they wanted to give the illusion that they had given the entire amount, that they had been completely unselfish in their giving. All right, they wanted the apostles and the people around them to think that they had given the whole amount, and they did not correct them and tell them that they had kept some for themselves. Um, they wanted to have their cake and eat it too, as the old saying goes, receiving that recognition, that admiration from the church leaders and from all the church members around them. And at the same time, having this nice little nest egg, this little savings account stashed away 
for their own use that they thought nobody knew about. But God knows all. And he allowed the Apostle Peter to know what it is that they were up to. So, Peter confronts Ananias. All right, if we look at Acts chapter 5, verse 4, Peter says to Ananias, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And then just a few verses after that, <clears throat> Peter confronts Sapphira as well, and Sapphira lies to Peter's face, telling him, telling him directly that they had given the entire amount that they had received for the land. So Peter says to her, How is it that ye have agreed together, referring to her and her husband, to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? And if uh, we remember the story, we remember what the penalty was for their sin. All right, no sooner had Peter condemned them for their sin and made them realize the seriousness of what they'd done than they dropped dead right there in Peter's presence. Now, just because we're Christians doesn't mean we're not going to sin. Okay, as, uh, as the other old saying goes, Christians aren't perfect. We're just forgiven, right? But even still, as Christians, we should constantly be examining our actions, realizing that everything we do, everything we say, is a witness to all of those around us. We, you know, we have to ask ourselves, would I really be lying on that tax form, those, those, those tax forms that I'm filling out? Would I be cheating? Would I be lying on those if Jesus Christ were sitting in the seat right next to me? If Jesus were working alongside me, all right, in my place of employment, would I constantly be sneaking out to the break room taking extra breaks, taking a lot more breaks than I know my company actually authorizes. And yeah, I know, I'm probably stepping on some toes with that one too. <clears throat> Another situation is um, being given incorrect change at a restaurant or a uh, store. Have you ever had that happen to you? Most of us have. You know, you're in the line at the supermarket, you know, you've just paid for your groceries, and the cashier is fumbling with the bills in her cash drawer, and a couple of bills get stuck together, she hands it back to you, and you, you realize right away that she gave you ten, maybe even more, more and change than you're entitled to. As Christians, how do we deal with that? Are we honest? Do we give the money back? Or do we, uh, you know, kind of look around, stick the money in our pocket, and uh, and just kind of think to ourselves, hey, <laughs> Christmas came early this year, right? Hmm. As with everything, we should always look to Jesus Christ for our example. How did Christ handle himself when he came face to face with the true master of deceit, the devil himself, when he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Jesus used what is the greatest weapon in our Christian arsenal, and that's the Word of God. Even Satan, Satan tried to use the Scripture in a way in which he knew it was not intended to be used, you know, deviously, deceitfully twisting the intended meaning of the scripture as he foolishly tried to deceive and to tempt Jesus Christ. That Jesus as, you know, as always, he could see right through what the devil was doing. And he proved once again 
that Satan is no match for our Lord and Savior. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video today. Uh, if you have not yet made that crucial decision to accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, I urge you to do so today wherever you are, wherever you may be. All right, repent of your sins. Ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and live your life according to His Word. Thanks for watching and God bless.